And here are the pieces done on the loom, old pieces. Next. I want to talk a little bit about gold and um, uh, silver work and gold work and silk work done um, in Florence during the Renaissance. This is a beautiful church on Via Tornaboni, the Fifth Avenue of Florence. And um, it goes back to the 12th century. And in the later years, in the 16th century, one of the Medicis was getting married there. And it was too austere looking. So they had a professional embroiderers do all of this beautiful embroidery to decorate the church. And I saw it the first time maybe 10 years ago because all of the shops on Via Tornaboni paid for the restoration of the pieces and for the hanging of them. And they said it would be the one and only time. And I was so thrilled to be there. Well, this is my third time. I always go in there to say a little prayer and light a candle, and I'm rewarded because this is the third time I've seen them. So this is how they decorated the church. And next, you'll see some of the close-ups. Next. But look at the beautiful silk work. And it's interesting because sometimes if I'm sitting in there just looking, and they do allow you to photograph, no flash, um, I'll hear some English-speaking people saying, how do they paint that? And I'll turn around and say, that was stitched. It wasn't painted. <laughs> Next. This is a beautiful piece, instead, 17th century from Venice. And we have beautiful silk work, uh, gold and silver, and then beautiful bobbin lace at the bottom done in gold. Next. Close-up of the beautiful silk work. Next. Very rare, and these are no longer there in storage, and nobody knows when they'll come out again. The two panels on the right-hand side uh, came off of all of the vestments and decorations that were done for the Duomo in Florence for the Feast of St. John, and they became, they were done during the Renaissance. In fact, they have the name of the seven male embroiderers Five were Florentine, one was Venetian, and one was French, who did all these embroideries that were uh, designed by the Renaissance painters. And they took the vestments apart, and they had these all mounted. And they went away last year uh, out of the museum, not to be seen again, who knows when. On the right-hand side is a detail of a parasol used for religious uh, processions. Next. And a beautiful piece I have here with me that was given to me by the director of the uh, Silk Foundation in Florence. And he had taken this off of a 16th century chasuble that had fallen apart. And um, he gave me that. And the upper part is um, um, for a chalice cover, all in silk and gold. These are all Renaissance uh, 16th century. Next. And then I could give a whole lecture on church work, but I just want to show you a little bit of the gold work. Next, a detail. Next. And then all the churches all over Italy, you will always find worthwhile going into just to see. They always have a statue, if not several. This is the Madonna and Child in beautiful embroidered garments. So it's always wonderful to see in the churches and then processions. Next. This is a beautiful ex voto done for a baby's crib or carriage. This was a copy of a very old one done several hundred years ago which we found in Edici, a little town in Sicily. And there's a piece of coral, and then there's a, a silkwork embroidery done around, and little sequins. And because coral always had the magical powers to keep evil spirits away. So they would make these little, beautiful little hearts to hang up either on the crib or the carriage to keep away the evil spirits. Next. And here on the left is a beautiful christening gown, which is just the front, and it was laced in the back. And I happened to be when, with my friend when it was brought to her by a noble lady. And um, it had been in the family since 1700. And if you look at the top right-hand side, you can make out some writing, white and white. And my friend had to put on the next name, but every name from the 16th century to the present who wore that uh, uh, christening gown was embroidered with the date. So in the center, you see beautiful, it was a beautiful uh, uh, silk embroidery. And then beautiful Venetian lace. Next. Shawls, of course. This is about 100 years old. Beautiful, all long and short, shading stitch in silk. Next. Close up of it, next. But the place to go for a shawl, and they are making them today. You can buy them. Uh, they're pretty pricey. They're probably $3,000 and up. But in Sardinia, or sorry, that's the Italian, Sardinia, um, in the town of Oliena, which is in the central part of Sardinia, uh, the town is famous for these black shawls, 
with beautiful embroideries, and the ladies wear them on all festive occasions. And um, exquisitely done. Next. And this is one of my favorites. I just thought this was so contemporary. And this, is, this was in the family, so over 100 years old. Next. I mean, isn't that contemporary and beautiful in design? Yeah. Yeah. And they wear them. And it's interesting. This town, when I went to the festival, and they were all uh, with them, they just looked beautiful. But um, each of the island is divided. One has a uh, Catalan. Um, uh, influence the other part. This part has an Arabic influence. The other part has an Italian influence. It's a fascinating land. Next. And this is more Arabic looking. And this is the other style they, they use. All done in gold and silver and jewels. The town is Oliena. Just beautiful. Next. Next. Then, of course, my goal ever since I was a student, and I've, I've almost reached my goal, is to attend all of the beautiful um, uh, uh, festivals and processions. And um, they do an outstanding job. And many of these processions, this one is the historical uh, procession in Orvieto that I was talking about. And it was started many years ago because they were not coming for the celebration. And so Italians love. Uh, you know, wearing costume and putting on a, una bella figura to look good. And so they started inviting. On Saturday night, it's for the women. And they have lovely costumes, but the more important ones are Sunday morning and the men. And this particular gentleman who has a beautiful costume, he doesn't live there anymore, but he comes every year. And he was telling me, because I had the privilege of going where they were putting on their costumes and all and talking to them and photographing them. And he said every year he has a diet about a month or so, too, that he can fit into this um, outfit. <laughs> but They've all been hand embroidered, historically researched by all the women out in the countryside. Next. This is when he was getting dressed. Next. You can see the close up. This is the border you saw it in the front, and the back, the beautiful cape with the hood. All done in beautiful black embroidery. Next. Then, one of the most important, and I've gone. Uh, twice, and I made the mistake of telling my little grandson when he was little, I used to always bring him back something from the polio, a, a poster or a, a mug or something like that. So his whole room is decorated for the polio, the, which is a famous racehorse that lasts for four minutes around the square. Um, but the procession lasts for four hours, and the costumes are incredible. And so I told him that when he was old enough, well, this is the summer. So July 3rd, I'm going to be standing with thousands of people one more time and hope I won't be killed. But the, the most beautiful costumes I think I've seen so far. And all hand embroidered by all the different workshops. Next. You can see. And um, I had to get special permission to get real close to take these. And the policeman kept saying to me as the horses went by, he said, Senora, you have to move back. You're going to be killed by a horse kicking you. But um, the, the embroidery is beautiful. And each contrata, the city is divided since the Middle Ages into 17 neighborhoods. And each has a museum and a, care, a caretaker to take care of these beautiful costumes. And the silk um, flags, they are the most famous flag throwers of all of Italy. And they put on all of this while they're marching around, those silk banners are all handmade, run $5,000 and up to be made. They're, they have to be very light. Next. So any of these, oh, oh go back, that's the most important. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. OK, another one. And um, uh, this is the third time I've gone. Uh, we spent, and several of you here were with me, uh, I always wanted to do again uh, Easter, Pasqua in Sicily, and we went. And we went running around to all of the different processions. And I could do a, a slide presentation just on that. But the most beautiful, again, are from Pian delle Albanese, which means the Plain of the Albanians. And these Albanians came over in the 14th century and hid out all over Sicily. They have about 14 towns in Sicily and southern Italy. And they've remained. And they're called the Arabesh. And so when you go to their towns, everything is written in Italian and their language, Arabesh. And we asked the young people um, where they speak which. And they said they are born speaking Arabesh, but when they go to school, they speak Italian. Wonderful people. So these designs are more 
they were showing us the inspiration from costumes from the 14th century Albania. The gold work is beautiful. And I was down on my hands and knees taking these photographs with some Japanese ladies who were, belonged to a kimono group. And they had come over just to see these costumes. And they're trying to speak to me in broken English to tell them that they, they do gold work too. And the most wonderful thing I have found with these young people is that they are thrilled and very orgulloso, very proud to wear these costumes. And my husband said that I had to take pictures of the men because the last two times I had taken no pictures of men. So the next photo, <laughs> the young men. And beautiful embroidery. And they're very proud to wear these. And it was beautiful. They were at the bottom of the hill before you entered the town. And they asked the cars to stop. And they come with a big basket of red dyed Easter eggs to give you for good fortune and to welcome you to the town. And the young man on the left, um, when we started talking to him, spoke a beautiful English, and he had won a scholarship, um, a Rotary scholarship, and he had studied a year in upstate New York at the university, and very proud, and so he filled us all in. And they also wear these outfits on all special occasions, but also um, for their weddings. Next. And then we have Clotta here. You'll see the beautiful hand weavings of Perugina towel. If you study any Renaissance painting in Italy, the tablecloth is always done from Perugia, because if you were anybody, the weavers during that time were from Perugia, and they were usually done in the blue and white. And there's only one family that's still Clotta's family, uh, and her daughter runs it now, that still do the beautiful weaving, La Tessitura. Next. And the traditional designs, and they, again, they can tell you exactly, and usually they can tell you what church to go see the fresco in which you'll see the painting of this fabric. Next. Next. The beautiful old designs, next. And again, you always see this is the, the typical design of Perugia, the famous medieval fountain, and the, um, uh, uh, the uh, I just forgot the name. Griffin. The griffin, thank you, il griffone, um, uh, drinking from it like that, the symbol of Perugia. Good, next. Cl Marta, who is an art student who went to La Brera for four years to study, was doing the traditional things, but just she liked the new young women saying, you know, I want to make this my own, but yet I want to honor the past. So she has taken these beautiful old designs, working with the decorators and interior decorators in Italy, and she's doing beautiful new things in new combinations and new colors. Next. And here you can see some of the samples. But these designs go way back into Etruscan and Roman times. Next. And here are just a few of the wonderful ladies that I want to thank that have shared so many things with me, just as they did in the Renaissance. Next. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good. I was hoping to have time um, to share, uh, first of all, if you have any questions and then um, to give you time to look at the beautiful things here. Because again, as much as I try to share through slides, um, there's nothing like seeing the real thing. And all of my pieces that are here, not that beautiful hat, will be going in the next few years uh, back to Florence where I had the great privilege for years to study there. And they've always been so good to me, so they're thrilled to have all my antique pieces. Thank you so very much for beginning uh, this morning. And uh, do we have questions? Yes. Oh, an ex voto would be ex hyphen v u o t o. Armida, can I have you come up close? To I really didn't see the hat. I mean, it was just made for you, but I wanted to see it up close, please. Uh, because I was just there in May at their last lesson. I didn't see someone. This is beautiful. The designer of this is downstairs. She's a new, um, questo è sempre Katia, vero? Yeah. Yeah, and she's downstairs demonstrating, and she wants to do things different. It's truly beautiful. So again, um, like I'm teaching Amelia Arts this way, but I'm, I'm not doing it in the traditional manner, but I love you to know the history and where these things come from. But then I think it's very exciting to adapt it, and that other hat is just mag magnificent, as well as the christening dress, which is more traditional, like that. Dietro. <laughs> uh, 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 no. Come si fa? No. Yeah, no, lei vuole che me lo metto come. Era il cappello.
and and cozy. Okay. So beautiful. <laughs> Well, there was no way I could, could lecture with this. I'd go crazy like that. But I mean, it, I mean, it's so exciting they're doing things like, I think, right? And we, as embroiderers, can do this. You know, I would love to. That would give that lady something to talk about, right? <laughs> Oh, that's right. You, that's, that's true. That. And yeah. You go to church, you can see the priest, he can see you, uh, you know, you can take communion. Yes. In other words, the thing functions. Yes. That, you know, that's, not yes, yeah. Positive. And this is beautiful. Yeah. This is beautiful. That's what my wife sort of wants me to make. From the yeah, well, and it makes me think of, you could go to the next wedding in England. Don't they all wear those hats? Yeah, that would be yeah, that, that's really delightful on you. Well, to me, I just saw them this morning when you did because I, um, I had to show off, you know, the Grand Canyon yesterday to the Italians, and they loved it. It was wonderful. Um, but um, these are beautiful, like that cover. It's just wonderful. And I guess I'm very excited about this work because we were there at the last lesson. And the age um, span was uh, big. I mean, it was from young girls to um, uh, Paola's um, mother, I mean, to older women. And it, what's so good for me, because I've been going for over 50 years, was, and several friends remind me, I remember 20 years ago or so, I felt like everything was being lost. There was nothing written down, except for these old books over 100 years old that were uh, hard to find. And if you found them, they were you know, hundreds of dollars. I mean, I spent all my money on these books, which I'm returning to the museum because I want students to be able to go there and study them without charging them. Um, and I really was desperate. And that's what really forced me to start doing everything on Italian design, because I didn't want these stitches lost. And my philosophy always was to teach them on a large scale. Those of you who have been around a long time uh, remember Jacqueline Entoven. And she was a great mentor to, uh, for me. And she always encouraged me, along with Constance Howard and Elsa Williams. And they used to say, no, keep doing your research, because I would tell ha Constance, I disagree with a lot of the things the English have written, because they're interpreting things and it's not the way they're done. They're interpreting what they see because they're not speaking Italian. And she said, no, you write what you learned from the ladies directly. And um, it's been wonderful. But Jacqueline used to always say, if you want to teach someone something, just use pearl cotton so they can see what they're doing. And I thought about that so much. Um, uh, Armida was with me, and so was Rivers when we were doing uh, our class. And we could not see the threads if our teachers had not pulled the threads for us. We couldn't do the Caso Guidi. Um, so I had to laugh, and I thought, I'm glad that I teach with a pearl five. <laughs> and then after that, you can do anything you want. You can do it any size you want. I mean, if you want to do a 52-inch you know, account, that's fine. If you want to do it on large rug canvas, that's fine. Make it your own. And I just study these slides sometimes, and I learn so much about finishing. Because you know, I look at these things so often, and in the beginning I'm looking at the design and the balance and the harmonious balance between the open and closed areas. And then I start, I think, okay, what do they do with the edgings? I haven't even looked at the edgings. And then I see so much that we can do. And I have to say my ladies at home with their pillows, so many of them have finished, if you can imagine, using a bullion to finish joining the two sides. But what an elegant finish that we're capable of doing. So I hope that you've gotten some new ideas today. Okay, good. And then I'll